Hello everyone, this is Robin Pearson from the History of Byzantium podcast. If you're one of those people who loves Roman history but thinks it all ends in the 5th century, then do I have a treat for you. Roman history has only just begun. Come to Constantinople with me and hear about the second Roman millennium, which is filled with some of the greatest stories in history. Find the History of Byzantium wherever you get your podcasts or visit thehistoryofbyzantium.com. But for now, it's back to Dirk and the history of the Germans. Hello and welcome to the History of the Germans, episode 52, The Honours of the Empire. This week we finally get our narrative going. Barbarossa will boost the honour of the Empire by burning cities, hanging heretics, slaughtering rebel-rousing Romans and inventing the concept of the university. But before we start, just a reminder, the History of the Germans podcast is advertising free thanks to the generous support from patrons. And you can become a patron too and enjoy exclusive bonus episodes and other privileges from the price of a latte per month. All you have to do is sign up at patreon.com slash historyofthegermans or on my website historyofthegermans.com. You'll find all the links in the show notes. And thanks a lot to Elliot, Otto and Craig who have already signed up. Last week we talked amongst other things about the new generation of princes who surrounded Barbarossa. These young men, and I'm afraid they're all men, had a very different outlook from their forefathers. They saw the provincial kings of France and England rising up in the world, whilst their ruler, Conrad III, could not even acquire the imperial crown, let alone be the universal monarch his title made him out to be. The weakness of the king reflected the weakness of the empire, and that by extension meant that they, the princes as branches of the same empire, appeared weak. The sources talk a lot about the honour of the empire, or honoris imperii in Latin, as the key motivation in Barbarossa's reign. What that is exactly is much in dispute. And Barbarossa and his princes, who did not speak Latin, would not ever have used the word anyway. In broad terms, it is something between respect, status and authority. Honour is diminished when imperial orders are disregarded, or when someone, usually the Pope, claims to rank above the Emperor. In a governance system with zero institutions, how can an emperor make sure his orders are implemented and nobody contests your status? Conrad III and Lothar III before him thought that the only way to make people do what you want was brute force. Burn their castles, massacre their peasants until they understand. Barbarossa and his circle are different. They believe that the emperor, by force of his office, his personality and his honour, is to be obeyed, as long as he is a just lord. And Barbarossa made sure he was a just lord, by delegating all major decisions to the court of the princes. The princes were then bound to uphold the honour of the empire by enforcing that decision. And if they encounter resistance in implementing the decision, it's not just the emperor's authority and standing that is at risk, but the honour of the empire as a whole, and that of each individual prince as well. If you listen carefully, you can hear the echoes of Otto von Nordheim's speech in 1073 when he attacked Emperor Henry IV, saying, As long as he was a king to me and acted royally, I also kept the oath I swore to him freely and faithfully. But after he ceased to be a king, the one to whom I had to keep loyalty was no longer there. And the first thing the honour of the Reich demanded was for Barbarossa to be crowned emperor in Rome. With the empire north of the Alps largely at peace, an expedition to Rome was a much easier proposition than it had been for Conrad III just two years earlier. In preparation of the journey, negotiations with Pope Eugene III began that will end in the Treaty of Constance. This is again another indication how the balance of power between popes and emperors had shifted in the last century. A little more than a hundred years earlier, Barbarossa's great-great-grandfather Henry III a journey to Rome without even knowing exactly who the current Pope was, and when he had doubts about the validity of the one who presented himself, he had all three contenders to the papacy deposed and a new one put in place. Now, the Emperor has to negotiate terms with the Pope. 
delegations moved back and forth between Germany and whichever small town the Pope currently resided in to find an agreement. The terms of this agreement, later called the Treaty of Constance, can be summarized as follows. 1. Barbarossa shall not make peace with either the Roman Commune or the Sicilians without consent of the Pope. The Empress to make best efforts to subject the Romans to the Pope and the Holy Mother Church. 2. The Emperor, as advocate of the Church, was to preserve and defend the papacy and all its legal rights. 3. The Emperor promises not to cede any land in southern Italy to the King of the Greeks, which was to mean Emperor Manuel in Constantinople, and should Manuel invade, both Pope and Emperor would combine their forces to throw him out. 4. The Pope on his part would crown Barbarossa Emperor, would help him in accordance with his duty to the papal office to maintain, increase and expand the honour of his realm. And 5. Finally, the Pope promises to warn and, if necessary, excommunicate anyone who dare to trample underfoot or overturn the imperial honour. Many a tree have been felled and carbon pigment expanded on the question who got one over in this agreement. Given that opinion is split almost exactly 50-50, it must have been one of those compromises that left either side believing they got what they wanted until they find out that they did not. And even if Barbarossa had signed a bad treaty, he still benefited by calling in the papal obligations now and leaving his own commitments for later. Pope Eugenius III had already made a number of decisions in Barbarossa's favour, even before the ink was dry. First up, he deposed the Archbishop of Mainz, who you may remember was the only significant elector who had opposed Barbarossa at his elevation. And secondly, the Pope annulled his marriage to Adela of Vorburg. Barbarossa had no particular liking for his first wife that had been chosen for him by Conrad III, but more importantly, her political usefulness had vanished when her father had died, and even more problematic, the couple had no children. So, a few monks were assembled to go through the rickety Stauffer family tree, and unsurprisingly, they found a common great-great-grandmother, and bingo, the marriage was annulled for consanguinity. Barbarossa used his newly acquired status as bachelor to paper over the most explosive clause in the Treaty of Constance. The promise to expel Emperor Manuel should he show up in southern Italy. That would be a big shift in Stauffer policy towards Constantinople. You may remember that Conrad III had maintained a close alliance with Manuel, who had cared for him when he was injured in the Second Crusade, and Conrad had promised him parts of Puglia as part of a marriage alliance, and even received vast amounts of cash to fund a campaign in Italy in 1149. As you may have heard on the history of Byzantium, Manuel's number one political objective was to weaken the King of Sicily and regaining a foothold in southern Italy, and for that he was counting on the Stauffer's support. It is unclear whether Manuel knew about the clauses in the Treaty of Constance, but it is not likely that Barbarossa had told him. What Barbarossa did instead of announcing his U-turn was to send envoys asking the Vasilev for the hand of his daughter, the beautiful, purple-born Maria. That must have been a ruse to string the Byzantine emperor along. Barbarossa needed his coronation more than any amount of Greek gold, and that meant he had to honour the Treaty of Constance, at least until he had done the business in St. Peter. After that, who knows? It is worthwhile to keep the communication channels open. So far, so good. We have a calm Germany, an invitation to Rome from the Pope, and we have kept the emperor in Constantinople at bay. Two more things need to be looked at before the horses can be saddled. The first is the Commune of Rome. As I mentioned before, the Roman population had increasingly enough of the popes and cardinals in their midst. By 1135, they had become full-on radicals. A charismatic preacher named Arnold of Brescia had appeared. Arnold's key message was that the Church should be giving up all the trappings of worldly power and revert back to the life of ascetic preachers. Somehow, this did not go down well with the mighty cardinals, and confrontation led to the expulsion of the papal court. 
The commune began to restyle itself as the ancient Roman Republic. It formed a senate and elected two consuls. The old sign, SPQR, the Senate and the People of Rome, that was once carried before the victorious legions that subdued the known world, re-emerged for the first time in 500 years, and with it, delusions of grandeur. Just by the way, it is still in use, mainly to grace manhole covers. The Senate had already written to Conrad III and offered to crown him emperor. And that letter was at least deferential and polite. The letter that Barbarossa received in 1153 was anything but. The writer made it clear that if Barbarossa did not come down pronto, something bad would happen. I guess that is not the way to talk to someone who rates his own honour above everything else. Being threatened by some shoeless rebel-rouser was just a thing to make the imperial blood boil. The Roman communal leaders were sent home with some choice words, and now Barbarossa had his own reason to go down to Rome and tell these jumped-up plebeians what is what. But these were not the only plebeians asking for imperial support. As Barbarossa was holding court in Constance and putting the finishing touches on the eponymous treaty, two citizens of the town of Lodi in Lombardy happened to travel through and seeing the line of petitioners waiting for the king, joined in to tell of their plight. Lodi lies 30 kilometers south of Milan and had come into conflict with the mighty metropolis. Milan was not only the largest and most powerful of the communes in Lombardy, it also did not like competition. And Lodi was, though small, still a competitor. So the army of Milan came and raised old Lodi to the ground, removing all fortifications and forced the inhabitants to move into undefended villages nearby. After this catastrophe, the Lodis began rebuilding their shattered lives. They set up a new market in a field near the main road, and things were slowly improving. But even a small market was unacceptable to the Milanese, and they shut that down too. Barbarossa heard their plight and, without hearing the other side, wrote a harsh letter to the consuls of Milan, ordering them to allow the market of Lodi to reopen. One of his ministeriales, a man called Sicher, was dispatched to Milan with a document bearing the imperial seal. Sicher first came to Lodi to tell the population what the emperor had decided. But instead of rejoicing, the citizens panicked. It is all good for some potentate from north of the Alps to make some ruling, but nobody has seen an emperor in Italy for 15 years, and the Milanese cavalry could be down here in half a day to burn the miserable huts they were living in now. They begged Sicher to go back home and forget about everything. But the poor man did not dare to disobey his master. He went to Milan, and the consuls had the letter read out in a public assembly. And that did not go down well. Not only did the Milanese refuse to obey, they tore the order to shreds and horror of horror trampled on the imperial seal. Even the hapless ambassador had to flee for his life. Barbarossa's honour demands that he comes to Milan and makes the city obey him. Not just Barbarossa's honour, it is the honour of the realm as a whole that is at stake. By October 1154, Barbarossa's journey to Rome finally sets off from Augsburg. He is in great company, and many of the new generation of princes are with him. Henry the Lion, Berthold of Zeringen, and his bannerman, Otto von Wittelsbach, Count Palatinate of Bavaria. But his army is quite small, just 1,800 armoured knights. The king may have brought peace to the realm, but not everyone trusts it will hold when the king is down in Italy, and as we all know, it is dangerous down there. Many of the old hands prefer to stay home and see what happens. The army crosses the Brenner Pass and after burning a castle belonging to the city of Verona and hanging its defenders, meanders its way down to the field of Roncaglia. These fields are, as the name says, a flat area outside the city of Piacenza, extremely suitable for royal assemblies in Italy. By the 12th century, Italy is fundamentally different from the empire north of the Alps. A German royal assembly is a family gathering of aristocrats that can take place in an episcopal palace or an imperial palace. Northern Italy has barely any major feudal lords left. 
During the last 150 years, the emperors have spent a total of just about 22 years in Italy, leaving the place without central authority for long stretches of time. And that is particularly true during the last 80 years of civil war. In the interim, the city governments have first taken over all the secular powers of their bishops and subsequently conquered the lands outside their walls. The local lords were all made to either flee or integrate into city society so that the area surrounding the city, the so-called Contado, had been cleared of Castellans. And then all these cities whose Contados shared a border tend to be constantly at war. The political map of northern Italy looks a bit like a chessboard. If you are a city on a white square, you are at war with all the cities on the black squares next to you. And you are allies with all the ones on the white squares. If an assembly would take place in a particular city, half the participants would be on enemy territory. So the only place where representatives of all the cities of Italy can meet without fear of being captured and murdered is an open field. The field of Roncalia. The first of Barbarossa's royal assembly is a great success. Nearly all the cities of Italy have sent representatives. Most cities have paid the fordrum, the traditional tax when the emperor is in Italy. Some cities go further. Genoa brought him lions, ostriches and parrots they had captured from the Muslims in Spain. Pisa too brought expensive gifts. The main point of the meeting was, however, not to gather trinkets, but to let the Italian subjects of the empire know that the king is back. Barbarossa's main concern was the size of his army. So he passed laws that required the cities and vassals, such as they were, to provide military support upon request. He also banned the sale of fiefs, as that would circumvent the ability to call for military service. And he set financial compensation levels for vassals who were unable to attend in person. He also began dispensing justice. He ordered the cities of Pavia and Tortona to make peace and exchange their captives from the recent war. Chieri and Asti were admonished for subordination and their complete destruction ordered, and Lodi was re-established. The Milanese had realized that this emperor was actually coming down to Italy and that he could make things quite uncomfortable for them. So they apologized profusely, offered an enormous sum, 4,000 pounds of silver, and a promise to rebuild Lodi and Como to make amends. Business concluded, and the next step was to be crowned King of Italy. To do that, he chose the small city of Monza, where Conrad III had been crowned. Presumably, he did not want to do it in Pavia, as was customary, since Pavia and Milan were hostile to each other, and going to Pavia would make the lovely 4,000 pounds of silver disappear. The two consuls of Milan even offered to lead the army from Roncaglia to Monza, and Barbarossa was happy to accept this generous offer from his new friends. All this business about the trampled seal was, it seems, forgotten. But the consuls led the army through a part of the country that had recently been completely destroyed in a war between Milan and Pavia. Lack of food and pouring rain made the journey an utter misery. Barbarossa is getting really angry now. He sends the two consuls home and asks them to come back with food and to open a market where the troops can revittle. But no food no market appears. That is the end of the reconciliation with Milan. When they come back with their 4,000 pounds of silver, he sends them packing. He takes his army and plunders the land of Milan for a while, but his forces are far too small to attack the great metropolis itself. And then he moves to Piemont to raise Chieri and Asti to the ground, as promised. Finally, he begins to point the army in the direction where he actually wants to go. Rome. On the way there he comes past the city of Tortona, an ally of Milan. When Tortona does not obey his demands to give satisfaction to Pavia, he loses the plot. His army may be far too small to attack Milan, but his honor demands some punishment, and that punishment will be borne by Milan's ally, the poor citizens of Tortona. He besieges the city for two months. Two months the Tortonese were waiting for help from Milan, they never came. Tortona's citadel sits on a steep hill overlooking the city, and it is a hard nut to crack. Though Barbarossa's allies, the city of Pavia, bring siege engines and a good dose of ruthlessness, 
progress is slow and brutal. Any defenders they capture are being hanged at large gallows within sight of the city walls. The city of Tortona has a great vulnerability. Water supply is from just one well outside the main citadel. Barbarossa's troop manage to at least temporarily capture that well, long enough to throw carcasses of animals and humans into it. And now the city has to surrender. Barbarossa allow the defenders to leave, but once they're gone, he has the city burnt to the ground. It had all gone off to such a good start, but look at it now. The Italians are used to brutal warfare. I mean, Milan had raised Lodi, Como and Novara to the ground, and the others weren't shy either. But taking sides against Milan so openly and so consistently would make it hard to be the impartial arbiter of the city disputes he would like to be. And as if he needed to make it clearer whose side he was on, he has himself crowned in Pavia, after all. Time to go south and regroup. And en route, he does a good deed, if not a great deed. By May 1155, he finds himself outside Bologna. Bologna has by now become famous as a place of great learning, in particular its school of law. The school's founder, Inerius had resurrected the Codex Juris Civilis, the law book of Emperor Justinian 527-565. It was the most comprehensive codex, the entirety of the existent law in the Roman Empire, and far, far, far advanced to any Germanic law texts in force at the time. Inerius had founded his school in the 1050s, and by the time of Barbarossa's visit, there were students from all over Europe getting trained in Roman law. But their legal status in the city of Bologna was precarious. In particular, the city had made all students from a particular area, say the French or the Burgundian or the Germans, liable for any debt incurred by one of their number. Students weren't good with money then, and judging by my own experience, still aren't. And on top of that, the typical antagonism between town and gown was already in full swing. Barbarossa took the side of the university and put students and lecturers formally under imperial protection. He made them only liable for their own debt, and they should only be judged by their magisters or the local bishop, not by a city court. This ruling, the Authentica Habita, was to be included in the Codex Juris Civilis, which made it applicable throughout Europe. This rule created the model of the independent university that still exists, even if students are now subject to local laws and courts. So, there was something really good in all that bloodshed. It's now June, and as we all know, that means time is running out. Rome is already dangerous, but in a few weeks there will be a hotbed of disease. All that wandering up and down in Lombardy and the siege of Tortona had cost too much time. On June 8th, the new Pope Hadrian IV and Barbarossa finally meet. Pope Eugenius III had died in 1153, his successor lasted a year, and now it was the time of Hadrian IV, Nicholas Breakspear from Hertfordshire, the only English Pope in history. Hadrian was an energetic and competent man with a long list of problems. The first one was to make sure that Frederick Barbarossa was a good son of the Church and sticking to the Treaty of Constance. On that count, things were off to a bad start. As the Pope arrived in the imperial camp near Sutri, he expected the new emperor to perform the service of strator and marshal, as Lothar III had done. These ceremonial services involved the emperor welcoming the Pope, at least a stone's throw from his accommodation, leading his horse to the entrance and then holding the papal stirrup as the Pope descends. What exactly went wrong here is unclear. Either Barbarossa outright refused, or did it wrongly, sloppily, or sourly. In any event, once the Pope had descended from his horse and sat down on his chair, he refused the kiss of peace, and all hell breaks loose. Why Barbarossa had failed to perform the act has been disputed. The older view was that these services would make him look like a vassal of the Pope, and hence his honour would not allow that. Modern historians believe it was a misunderstanding of sorts, 
which would mean that this was one of the very few public displays not meticulously planned beforehand. Anyway, the parties return to their respective camps. The Pope insists the ceremony is repeated, as that this was an ancient ceremony performed by all emperors in the past. As far as I can see, that is untrue. The first emperor ever to perform this service was Lothar III, and it had had consequences, if you remember episode 44. Barbarossa's archivists were, however, not as well versed with their history to refute the papal claims, and, as time was running out, 24 hours later Barbarossa repeated the whole procedure, and this time did as he was told. The relationship was off to a bad start. Pope and Emperor then progressed to Rome, where papal authority was limited pretty much to the right bank of the Tiber, what is now the Vatican City. The main city was held by the Senate and the people of Rome. One thing Hadrian had achieved, though. He had got rid of Arnold of Brescia. He was expelled from the city when the Pope threatened an interdict. Arnold was tried as a heretic. After the utterly unsurprising verdict, he was handed over to Barbarossa, who had him hanged, his body burned and his ashes thrown in the Tiber, so as not to leave a place for his followers to remember him. Whether that endeared the citizens to Barbarossa is unclear. They did come up to him, though, and offered to crown him if he would pay £5,000 of silver for the privilege. Again, not really a compelling offer, even if Barbarossa did not really got on with Hadrian IV. The delegation, however, meant something was up. Just to be on the safe side, Barbarossa deployed a thousand men to hold the Leonine walls and block the bridge across the Tiber by San Angelo. The next day was a Saturday, and coronations normally take place on Sundays. Or so the Romans thought. Hadrian and Barbarossa had decided that to avoid any more trouble, best thing to do was to pull the coronation forward to Saturday. So the King of the Romans arrives, surrounded by armed guards, at the church of Santa Maria in Turi, just outside Old St. Peter's, and offers the traditional coronation oath. The Pope asks him whether he wants to be a faithful son of the church, and he answers three times that yes, he will. The Pope now covers him with his mantle, and the Emperor kisses his chest. Pope and Emperor then enter the atrium of St. Peter through the silver gate, where prayers are spoken, then more prayers as he reached the rota, the giant circular plate of red marble that is still at the entrance of St. Peter, and finally he is anointed in front of the relics of St. Peter. During the Mass, Hadrian hands him the sword and scepter, and finally places the crown on his head. At that, the congregation shouts and screams with joy, so loud one might have thought a tremendous thunder had fallen from the sky. And that is what the Romans hear on the other side of the Tiber. Whilst the emperor returns to his camp and sits down for a great celebratory feast, the Romans coming out, armed to the teeth and angry. They may have still hoped to get their 5,000 pounds of silver for the coronation, or at least some other form of recognition or party or something. But what then follows is a brutal massacre. The civilians of Rome have no chance against the battle-hardened knights, even if they had not put on their armour. A thousand Romans were killed, two hundred captured, and according to the imperial chroniclers, only one of theirs was harmed. It might have looked like a great victory, but it also made the position of both the Pope and the Emperor in the Holy City untenable. Leaving behind the stench of rotting flesh, the two heads of Christendom travelled to Tivoli and then onwards to Spoleto. This journey did not improve imperial papal relations. Wherever they went, questions arose about who was whose vassal, which rights was to be granted by who, and just generally, who was in charge here? The party arrived at the Abbey of Farfa, an imperial abbey since time immemorial, and subject to so many imperial charters, I used to jump over them every time I saw one. Ah, Farfa again. But by 1155, the Pope was utterly convinced the abbey was now his, if only for the fact that no emperor had shown his face there for half a century. All these unresolved issues weren't really crucial in themselves, 
are they constantly implied that either party failed to recognise the honour and status of the other and gradually eroded the alliance the two sides had formed under the Treaty of Constance. The cities along the way are asked to pay the fordrum, the tax owed to passing emperors. Spoleto thought they could fool the emperor and paid him in worthless copper coins. They had hoped they'd get away with it because they held one of Barbara's followers, a Count Guido, in their power. That did not go down well, in particular not the imprisonment of the imperial envoy, and so Spoleto was besieged, captured and burned. For the next two days the army plundered Spoleto during daytime, but stayed in their camp during the night as the smell of burning flesh was so overpowering. This may all be sort of profitable for the soldiers, but it did not really do much for the actual military objective. Barbarossa had promised the Pope to overcome the Roman Commune and to break the hold of the Normans on southern Italy. As for part one, that had already failed, leaving objective number two. There were some promising signs for a successful campaign. The great King Roger II had died in 1154 and his son, William I, was struggling to gain control, in particular over the rebellious feudal lords on the mainland. He and his chief minister, Mayo of Bari, were pushing for ever more centralization of the government and squeezed the barons out of positions of power. No wonder they called him William the Bad. This discontent could have proved the opportunity for Frederick to deliver against his promise in Constance. Very much like in Luther the Third's days, the barons of Puglia were ready to rise up and the cities were happy to join and another advantage was at hand. Emperor Manuel had sent two of his best generals, Michael Paleologos and John Ducas, with a small army and a big chunk of cash to Ancona. They were to team up with Frederick and capture Puglia. For several days the two sides negotiate, but in the end there is no deal. Two things are stopping Frederick. The first was the Treaty of Constance. Barbarossa had promised the Pope not to make an agreement with Manuel that would give the Byzantines control over Puglia or any other part of Italy. And that would have been the demand from Constantinople. I mean, these guys were not handing over fine gold out of the goodness of their hearts. So doing a deal without papal consent would have caused a lot of friction in the already difficult relationship with Hadrian IV. He may have taken the risk if the chance of success would have been high enough. The Byzantines had, however, brought only a small army to add to Barbarossa's already modest forces. And it is now the height of summer, and his vassals have already made clear that they are not keen on a campaign in southern Italy. They have been here for over a year. Again, it is the same scenario as 17 years earlier, when the German princes ended Lothar III's campaign in Puglia. Barbarossa puts all this in the too-hard box and decides to go home. The alliance with Byzantium is now dead, as is his chance to marry a gorgeous purple-born Greek princess. Palaiologos and Dukas go it alone and have some initial success. They even capture Bari. In the process, they drive a final nail in the coffin of German-Byzantine relations by showing letters bearing Barbarossa's signature that purport a transfer of ownership of Puglia to the Vasilev. These may either be fake or being used at least without consent. And in the end, the Byzantine endeavour fails, the small army perishes, and the two generals die manfully in battle. As for Barbarossa, his return home also allowed for true heroism. As the army was about to leave Italy, they had to pass Verona, a city whose castles they had sacked on the way down and whose citizens were none too happy to see them coming up again. They did provide a bridge across the river Adige, or Etch in German, outside the town for the army to cross, but otherwise they stayed behind their walls. The army followed the Etch river for about 25 kilometers from Verona and reached the Chiusa di Verona, or the Veronesa Clause, where the river valley narrows with steep mountains on both sides. And that is where the Veronese had decided to trap the army. They blocked the exit and the entrance with large boulders and their archers shot at the advance guard of the army. There was no way out. 
to the left, the ice-cold, fast-flowing river edge. Ahead and behind, well-defended enemy positions, and to the right, the sheer cliff of the Cusa di Verona. The enemy demands were not political, but purely financial. They required that every knight, including the emperor himself, was to hand over their armor, their horses, and their weapons. This was totally unacceptable. Imagine the emperor returns from his trip to Italy with barely the clothes on his back. His rule would have ended even more ignominiously than Conrad III. But it did not. If you want to see a great depiction on how he got out of the cliffhanger, you have to go to Munich. There, in the gardens of the royal residence, the Hofgarten, a 19th century painter depicted the most glorious moments in the history of the House of Wittelsbach, the kings of Bavaria. And that cycle of fresco starts with Otto von Wittelsbach in the Veronesa Klause. Otto was an accomplished warrior and he and his Bavarian knights were also skilled climbers. In the night, unseen by their enemies, 200 of the brave Bavarians scaled the sheer cliff carrying their weapons and their armor. No ropes, no harnesses, no crampons. Just straight up the wall. And as the sun rose, they planted the imperial banner and with wild screaming descended upon the thieving Veronese. At the same time, Barbarossa and his men attacked from the front. In less than an hour, the opponents sued for mercy but none was forthcoming. These weren't really combatants. They were robbers after monetary gain, not knights fighting for glory. Barbarossa had all the survivors hanged alongside the road. And so ended the first of Barbarossa's journeys to Italy. He had achieved his main objective, he had received the imperial crown, but he had not achieved much else. His relationship with the Pope was on the rocks, since he neither cleared out the Roman commune nor defeated the king of Sicily. His alliance with Emperor Manuel in Constantinople was now permanently dissolved. The northern Italian cities remembered him for the brutal siege of Tortona, the destruction of Chieri, Asti and Spoleto, and the hanging of so many. As he heads back, one idea takes hold in his mind. Italy was so immensely rich, so much richer than Germany, that if he had been able to establish a permanent rule over Italy, he would truly be as powerful as his great predecessor, Otto the Great and Charlemagne. He must also have realized that the two biggest issues he had faced were the small size of his army and the unreliability of his vassals, who wanted to go home just when things had become interesting. Fighting for the honor of the empire was a motivator for many of the younger princes, but it seems not enough for all. Next time he needs to come with more men and stay for longer, and to do that his governance model needs a tweak. What that is, and how he fares on his next round, we'll find out next week, and I hope to see you then. And in the meantime, if you want to get deeper into the Byzantine side of the Mediterranean conflicts, I strongly recommend The History of Byzantium by Robin Pearson, you've heard in the introduction. Robin's been tracing the Eastern Empire since 2012, and I've been following ever since he started. His in-depth knowledge of the subject and ability to distill most important facts makes listening to his podcast such a joy. Our narratives are currently almost in parallel. So if you want to get the Byzantine perspective on the alliance between Manuel and Barbarossa, check out episode 235. I cannot recommend that enough. <laughs>